invite you this morning to turn in your Bibles to Exodus chapter 17. Exodus 17, and we are continuing our series this morning entitled Portraits of Salvation. And we're looking at how God used the story of bringing uh, Israel out of Egypt to paint a picture of our salvation and to prepare us for to, uh, to recognize Jesus. And so we've looked at the different portraits so far uh, about how God in salvation, that slaves are set free, how God's people are passed over, how God's people are delivered, how hungry people are fed. Last week we looked at how thirsty people are satisfied. And this morning uh, we're looking at how God's enemies are defeated. One of the pictures, one of the themes that God uh, puts together to prepare us for salvation is to show us how that part of what our salvation means is that our enemies uh, are defeated. And this story is in Exodus chapter 17. It's right after uh, the story of, uh, that we looked at last week, right after God uh, provided water uh, through the rock. Uh, they're attacked. Now, how many of you know that a lot of times uh, the enemy is there to attack you right after God's given you some water to drink? Amen. You have a great spiritual time. The Lord does something uh, amazing in your life. And uh, every time that happens, you can very much be prepared uh, that there's going to be an attack. And so that happened to Israel, and they're attacked uh, by their enemies, the Malachites. And so I want us to see three things about how our salvation uh, in, in this story of, enemy, of Israel's first battle. Now, you know, they have already experienced being delivered from their enemies when Pharaoh and his army came. And you'll remember that there, Pharaoh came with his chariots and uh, Pharaoh's army uh, would have crushed Israel. There would have been no opportunity for Israel to defend itself because, you know, Israel is not battle-hardened at this point. They've not been any, in any fights or, or, or they weren't warriors. They were, you know, slaves and they had uh, spent their whole lives building uh, pyramids, you know, and making bricks and building buildings and all this kind of stuff. And uh, they're at the Red Sea, and you remember that uh, Pharaoh comes, and, and Pharaoh's secret weapon is he's got chariots. Chariots were like the tanks, you know, of that day. And, uh, and so they were vastly overpowered uh, by Pharaoh. But you remember how that the Lord put the Shekinah glory of God, the cloud by day, the fire by night, right in between Egypt and the army of Egypt and, and, and Israel, God's people. And he kept it, uh, Egypt at bay, and Moses separated the Red Sea. Uh, Israel took all night for them to go across. They got went across on dry land, and then Pharaoh's armies tried to go across, and as they were crossing, God let the Red Sea come back uh, together and drowned all of, uh, of, of Pharaoh's army. So God has delivered them from a far superior army, but now they're about to have to fight their first battle. They're about to have to fight a, their first battle, and we see that story in Exodus chapter 17. And the first thing I want you to see about salvation in this story is that God uses our faith to defeat our enemies all right we're going to learn that God uses our faith to defeat our enemies all right now let's look at the story and see how our battles are won through faith in the story of, uh, of, of the Malachites now look at, at chapter 17 verse 8 and you see here that then Amalek came and fought against Israel at Rephidim. Now, Israel's not in, uh, they're not in the promised land yet. They're still in the Sinai Peninsula. And the Amalekites were a people that lived in that area. And, you know, probably they got word. I mean, it, it's, you know, they, they know what's going on in their, in their countries there and, and heard of, of Israel and, and what happened to Pharaoh. And so now they're coming out to make sure that Israel uh, doesn't do anything to them. I mean, you know, when, when, a, when a, a group of people plunder Egypt, that, that word spreads, right? And so these uh, Amalekites are coming out uh, to try to, uh, to get the first strike, so to speak. And you need to know about the Amalekites. Here's one of the things. Uh, this would have been, again, they wouldn't have been as powerful as Pharaoh's army, but they were much stronger than, than Israel's army, all right? Israel's not an army. They're just a group of people coming out through there. Uh, and the Amalekites were known for one thing. You know what the Amalekites had on their side? You read about it later in Joshua. The Amalekites had fierce, now are you ready for this? Attack camels. It's true. They had, had, had mastered the art of using a camel in battle. Now, you may think that's a joke, but I just, I just challenge you to go, don't do it right now, all right? But when you get home this afternoon, 
Google camel attack. Check out a couple of videos of camels gone wild, and you'll see pretty quickly, you know what? A camel's not something you want coming at you, buddy. <laughs> they can clear out a crowd. They're big, they're strong. Did you know camels are faster than horses? For the first three or four minutes of a run, now a horse will eventually outrun a camel. But the camels can run up to 45 miles per hour for the first four or five minutes of its run. They're fast, and they're strong. And if you Google attack camel, what you'll find out is a camel can actually grab a grown man by the head and throw him, <laughs> all right? Uh, so these camels are vicious. And the Amalekites had camels, and so uh, and they used them to attack. <laughs> and, uh, and so Israel is up against a situation here, once again, where, you know what, if they're left to their own power, if they're left to their own strength, they really didn't stand a chance. The Amalekites could have easily wiped the desert with them, all right, with their attack camels. But here's what happens. God delivers them. God defeats them. And I want you to see how God does it, all right? It's very, that's the point of this story. It's not just that, you know, the story could just be one verse. The Amalekites came and attacked Israel, and Israel defeated them in the name of the Lord, and they could have pressed on. But you don't have that. You've got a whole story here about how God did it, and it is a picture of our salvation. Notice what happens in verse 9. So Moses said to Joshua. Now, let's stop right there because I want to introduce you to Joshua. And Joshua himself is a picture of our salvation. This is the first time in the story, if you read from Genesis on, this is the first time in the story that we hear about Joshua. Uh, he's, he's, he's not mentioned before now. Now you know that later on uh, Joshua becomes the leader. But I want to tell you just a, uh, just a minute, give you some background on Joshua, because Joshua is a picture of Jesus. Did you know the name Joshua in Hebrew and in Greek is the same name as Jesus? Now English later on, Jesus is Jesus and Joshua is Joshua. But in Hebrew, both Joshua and Jesus is, is Yeshua. There's no difference. It's just Yeshua. And then also in Greek, Jesus is, is the same name for Joshua and Jesus. It wasn't until we got English Bibles in the uh, 1600s. Y'all know that Jesus didn't speak English, right? Okay, y'all just make sure you're good with that. Uh, also, Moses did not speak English, right? Uh, we didn't have English Bibles to about the 1600s. So if anybody ever tells you that one English Bible is the only right version of the Bible, you need to know that Jesus spoke in, in Aramaic and the New Testament was written in Greek, all right? It was not written in, in I hate to burst your bubble, uh, but that, that, is, that is the case. And so um, it wasn't until English came along that you got Joshua and Jesus being different names. Now here's what's cool about it, though. Yeshua in, in Hebrew literally means Yahweh saves. Yahweh is salvation. Jesus' very name meant that, that every, time, every time Mary said, Yeshua, come in for dinner, he was reminded that he is the Savior. He, Jesus saves, you know. Yeshua saves. Yahweh saves. And so uh, Joshua, though, you'll remember, is a central character to this story because he is the guy that, that, will, that loves the presence of the Lord. I mean, he has a passion for God. So, for instance, when Moses goes up on Mount Sinai in just a few chapters to receive the Ten Commandments, remember, it's, it's, it's Joshua who goes up halfway and waits on him, right? So Israel and Aaron and all the, all the folks are down at the bottom of the mountain. Moses is at the top listening to God. Joshua's about halfway because he wants to hear what's going on, you know, uh, with the Lord up there. You also remember that when um, uh, later on it talks about how that at the Ten of Meeting, that the, the, the glory of God, the cloud by day and fire by night, would come and, and stand at the tent of meeting with Moses there and would, and would speak to Moses face to face as a friend. You remember that verse? You remember Joshua was the one who would stay there. He would stay at the tent. Everybody else went home. Joshua would stay at the tent of meeting because he loved to be in the presence of the Lord. Joshua was also... The man, uh, along with Caleb, the only two spies who, when they went into the promised land to check out the situation, it was Joshua and Caleb who came back and had a faithful report and said, they're big, but we can take them. Everybody else said, oh, no, we don't want to go over there. We, we, we can't win this fight. Joshua and Caleb were the two that had faith, and Joshua and Caleb are the only two of the adults out of that generation who ended up going in the promised land. And Joshua is the one 
when Moses died, you remember last week we saw that Moses sinned. He struck the rock instead of speaking to it, right? Moses did not take Israel into the promised land. Who took Israel into the promised land? Yeshua. Yeshua. Moses has never saved anybody, friend. Only Jesus saves, amen? Only Jesus. The law cannot save you. Only Jesus can take you into the promised land. And so this is our first introduction to Yeshua. And guess what he's doing? He's fighting the battle. Now some of you may think, when you think of Jesus, you may think of little old sweet Jesus. We, we want Jesus to be real gentle. And he is gentle. We're going to see, I mean, he is gentle. But let me just tell you something. Jesus is a warrior. You need to understand Jesus is defeating enemies, all right? He is a king who's reigning on a throne, and every enemy of Jesus will be vanquished at the, end of, at the end of it all. And this is our first introduction to Yeshua. He is uh, fighting the battle. So notice how, how it happens in Exodus chapter 17, verse 9. So Moses said to Joshua, Choose men for us and go out. Fight against Amalek. Today or tomorrow I will station myself on the top of the hill with the staff of God in my hand. Now, you know that staff of God's been used a lot already, right? It's what uh, Moses used to throw down, and it became a serpent and, and ate all the other serpents there in front of Pharaoh and his magicians. It's, uh, it's also the staff that he used to part the Red Sea. It's the staff that he used to strike the rock, and, and water was brought out. And uh, now he's going to go up with that staff, and, uh, and, uh, and they're going to fight the battle. And notice what happens in verse 10. Joshua did as Moses told him and fought against Amalek. And Moses, Aaron, and Hur went to the top of the hill. Now, who are Aaron and Hur? They're going to be really important in just a minute. Aaron is Moses' brother. Uh, he's the one that God will choose out of, the, out of the Levites to become the great high priest. He's the first great high priest. And then Hur uh, is uh, another guy. We don't know much about him other than he's here with Moses. And then later on, uh, he is also one of the judges along with Aaron that Moses delegates to. And so Aaron and her seem to be uh, Moses' right-hand men, and they're there with, with Moses on the hill as the battle's going on uh, down in the valley. And then notice how, God win, how they win this battle. Verse 11, So it came about when Moses held his hand up that Israel prevailed, and when he let his hand down, Amalek prevailed. Now, can you see the story here? I mean, look, the, 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 the emphasis on the, in this story is not just that Israel defeats their, wins their first battle. The emphasis is on how the battle's won. And here's what's going on. Moses is up on a hill, and every time he holds his hands up, guess what? Israel wins. If he lets his hands down, Israel loses. How many of you know that when you're walking with the Lord, that your most powerful position is your complete surrender? <laughs> Listen, when you're surrendered to the Lord, God will fight your battles for you. If you're surrendered to God, and I believe that's one of the things it means when we lift up our hands. How many of you know it's okay to lift your hands in church? Now, you don't have to. God doesn't love people that lift their hands more than people that don't, all right? But let me just tell you, it's okay even in a Baptist church. Uh, we're just a, a little Baptist cost around here anyway. It's okay to lift your hands in church, all right? You can do that. One of the things you do when you say that is you, you're just saying to God, God, I surrender. <laughs> How many of you surrender to God? That's the one way of showing it. I, I give up. I surrender in a good way. You know what? Another thing you're saying when you lift those hands up, is, it's just, that's the, that is the universal sign of a child saying to their father, take me, God, I'm yours, right? I need you. That's what, how many of you know that, uh, you know, Hannah just got, uh, it just got engaged. She's about to be another man's uh, wife. And, uh, you know, she, I'm giving my daughter away. But let me just tell you something. That little girl can come up right now, put those hands up. I'd take her and do whatever I had to for her. Amen. I mean, that's just the universal sign. I remember the first, when she was little, just her putting those little hands up and me just grabbing her up. I'm going to quit talking about this or I'm going to have trouble. But uh, anyway, I'm going to back out of that, all right? Get back on, on focus. But uh, surrender, and, and, and that, that's what, I think that's what, what, what Moses did. As he's, as he's honoring God, listen, God is honoring Israel. And if you will honor the Lord, you know what? The Lord will fight your battles. The most important thing in your victory, in your life, to win the spiritual battles that you've got to face is your faith. It's not commitment. It's not willpower. It's faith. It's trusting and looking to the Lord. God uses our faith to win 
our battles. Now you know the Lord and the fact that He's a warrior fighting our battles is a major theme that you see in Exodus. This is a, a big picture that God is painting for us. You remember a few chapters back when, uh, when, when, when Israel was trying to get away from Egypt. Egypt, the army was there and uh, at the Red Sea. And what did God tell Moses? He said, the Lord will fight for you while you keep silent. Don't you love that verse? How many of you have learned to keep silent? You know, I'm going to tell you something. Keeping silent would help a lot of us even if the Lord wasn't fighting our battles. You know, a lot of times we get in trouble, we've got an enemy, and our mouth becomes our biggest enemy, does it not? I'm going to tell you, a lot of Christians would be better served just to keep silent uh, more than not. But you know what? If you are walking with the Lord, you can keep silent because you can trust the Lord to fight your battles. You don't have to tell everybody everything you want to tell them. You know what? You can let the Lord fight those battles, and He is perfectly capable of defending you. I, I'm just telling you, the longer I've walked with the Lord, the less I feel like I have to defend myself most of the time. <laughs> you know, When I was young, man, if you said something to me, I'd be quick to get right back. I had to defend myself. I don't, I don't feel like I have to do that hardly at all anymore. I, I'll be honest with you. When so, If somebody comes up to me and says, Pastor, you know, I hear this a lot. You know, Pastor, so-and-so said so-and-so. I, I mean, you know, most of the time if you say something about me to somebody, I just want you to know, it gets back to me. You, I hope you know that. Everybody, more people than you talk, all right? And so, you know, I'm aware when put somebody. But you know what? Here's the thing. I don't, I don't worry about that stuff. I don't worry about that stuff at all. When I hear somebody uh, is, is against me in some way, you know what I've learned? I've learned to pray for them. I've learned to pray for them. Here's one of the things the Lord's taught me is oftentimes my biggest opponents can become my biggest proponents. If I love them and pray for them, and, uh, and you know, they're not most of the time not upset with me. They're upset with themselves or the Lord anyway. And so, you know, uh, the Lord will fight for you when you keep silent. You've got to learn that in your walk with the Lord. And then not only does he say that, but then a few chapters after this battle, he's going to make a promise, a big theme of Israel's salvation, which becomes a big theme of our salvation, is God's promise to defeat our enemies. You see this in Exodus chapter 23, verse 20. Look at what God tells Moses he's going to do. He's going to protect them. He says in, in there, he says, Behold, I am going to send an angel before you to guard you along the way, and to bring you into the place which I have prepared. He's talking about taking to the promised land. He says, I'm sending an angel who's going to guard you. Now, look, you're going to have enemies there, but you don't need to focus on your enemies. How many of you know that everybody in this room, we've all got an enemy in our life? Everybody's got an enemy. And sometimes it might be people. How many of you know, though, our biggest enemies oftentimes are not people. They're, they're not physical enemies. They're spiritual enemies, right? The devil really is your enemy. I know, you know, we don't talk about that a lot uh, these days. But, you know, I'm going to tell you something. The, in, the devil's like a roaring lion uh, seeking whom he may devour. He is dead set against you. You've got a spiritual enemy. And, you know, a lot of times, sometimes our biggest enemy is ourselves, is it not? You know, sometimes we create our own problems, our own worst problems. And so we've got enemies. And so, but here's the thing God promises that He will defeat those enemies. You don't focus on the power of the enemy, you focus on the power of God. And when you fear God, listen to me, you don't have to fear enemies. If you will fear the Lord, you don't have to be afraid of enemies. But if you don't fear God, let me tell you, God will be an enemy to you. <laughs> you need to fear God. That's the key to it. Look at what he says. He said, I'm going to send this angel, and he's going to bring you in the place which I prepared. Be on your guard before him and obey his voice. Do not be rebellious toward him, for he will not pardon your transgression, but since my name is in him. In other words, the Lord's saying, listen, your biggest problem, Israel, is not Egypt. It's not the Amalekites. It's not the Hivites, the Jebusites, the Canaanites, and any of the other termites. Your biggest problem is the Lord. You need to make sure you please the Lord. And if you honor the Lord, look at what happens in verse 22. But if you truly obey His voice and do all that I say, then this is the Lord talking, then I will be an enemy to your enemies and an adversary to your adversaries. If you will honor the Lord, listen, the Lord will make your enemies His enemies. How many of you want the Lord to make for your enemies to be His enemies? Then you honor the Lord. You look to Him. You walk with Him. You get in line with Him. You focus on your relationship with God. And listen, God will take care of people. He will take care of people. And look at what He says, verse 23. For my angel 
will go before you and bring you into the land of the Amorites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Canaanites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. And I will completely destroy them, the Lord says. I will send my terror ahead of you and throw into confusion all the people among whom you come. And I will make all your enemies turn their backs to you. I will send hornets ahead of you so that they will drive out the Hivites, the Canaanites, and the Hittites before you. I'm just telling you, man, you want the hornets on your side. Amen. <laughs> and so if you want that, if you want the Lord to be on your side and your, your enemies to be his enemies, you honor him. You look to him. And that's what Abra, uh, Moses is doing. He's lifting his hands. He's acknowledging the Lord. And when he does that, the Lord fights for him. That becomes a major theme through the whole rest of the Bible. And then the second thing I want you to see is, is that God, uh, God uh, uh, defeats our enemies when, through our faith, by our faith. But I want you to say this, God helps us when our faith is weak. <laughs> God helps us when our faith is weak. Now listen, it's not just good news that God will, will protect you and defeat your enemies through faith. Listen, it's also good news that God will help us when our faith is is weak. Notice what uh, happens here in the story. Now you get the picture. Moses is up on the hill. Aaron and 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 uh, her are with him. Joshua is down in the valley. He's fighting the Amalekites. And uh, while Moses has his hands up, uh, Joshua is winning the battle. When his hands go down, the Amalekites uh, lose the battle or win the battle. Sounds easy enough, but but look at what happens to Moses. How many of you know he, you get tired? How many of you know you get you struggle? I'm so glad this is in the Bible. You know, the Bible is very honest about our struggle. Now, Christians may not be. You may have seen pastors who won't be honest about struggle. I just want you to know, you know, it's okay to struggle. I mean, you know, it's dangerous. It, there's, there's, there's dangerous. Struggling is not a good thing. It's good for you just to walk with the Lord. But the Bible is very clear that everybody struggles. Everybody struggles. And so Moses struggles. Notice what happens in verse 12. But Moses' hands were heavy. I mean, all he's got to do is keep his hands up. How many of you ever tried to keep your hands up very long, though, right? He got tired. And notice what happens. They help him. Look at the help that, 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 that he gets. First of all, and this is all a picture of our salvation, I believe. Look at this. Then they took a stone and put it under him, and he sat on it. They gave him a seat to sit on. And that seat was a rock. Now, how many of you know, we looked last week, that, that Jesus is the rock. Amen. He's the rock from source of water. I believe this is also a picture of our salvation in Jesus. How many of you know that our salvation is all, it's not based on what we do for God. It's based on, on receiving what God has done for us. It's based on us setting on the rock. Moses was fighting the battle. Now, listen, from a position of rest. Come on now. This is better preaching. Y'all are not listening like I'm preaching. I'm not trying to say, I'm, I'm just saying, I I'm, I'm not, may not be a good preacher, but that's good preaching. Amen? Come on. He is fighting the battle from a position of rest. He's seated in his salvation. He's sitting on the rock. That's good news. Listen, when you're fighting your battles, everybody in this room You've got a battle. You've got enemies. You've got struggles. Your victory is not based on your commitment to God. Listen, your victory is based on God's commitment to you. You're seated on a rock. It reminds me of what Jesus said at the end of the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 7. And he's talking about how that, that everybody that listens to him and obeys his word and acts on it, what are they like? They're like a man who builds his house on a rock. And when the, storm, when the storms come, not if the storms come, when the storm comes, what happened? That house will stand. Listen to me. You might be struggling this morning. You might have an enemy. You might have a, a person who's against you. You might have the devil coming after you. You might have a sickness or an illness that seems to be getting you down. You might have a struggle with a sin you can't seem to overcome. But listen to me. If you've given your heart to Christ, you're seated on a rock. You're safe. Rest in Him. Rest in Him. And your ability to win whatever battle you're facing it's not you getting more willpower. It's not you becoming stronger. Listen, it's you learning how to set. You set before you fight. 
And Moses is seated on this rock. Well, now look, that's not all. Look at what else happens. It says that he sat on it, and Aaron and her supported his hands, one on one side and one on the other. Thus his hands were steady until the sun set. So Joshua overwhelmed, <laughs> not just beat. I like this. Look, Joshua overwhelmed Amalek and his people with the edge of the sword. Look at what happened. He's seated on the rock. His hands are tired. Aaron comes on one side and her comes on the other. And they hold Moses' hands up because as long as Moses' hands up, they win the battle. How many of you know, first of all, that you cannot walk with Jesus by yourself? Now that cuts against the grain of everything America's about. I'm just telling you. We are John Wayne Christians in America. We, you know, and what I mean by that, if you watch a John Wayne movie, now some of you may be too, uh, too uh, young to know what John Wayne is. Go Google him. You can watch it on YouTube, all right? You, just, you need to know. Every generation needs to know who John Wayne is. John Wayne, movie star, every movie he made, he, was, he, was, he fought the Wild West. He fought Indians in the Wild West. He, he fought in World War II in the Pacific Islands. He fought every battle that was ever done. John Wayne had a movie about it. And here's the thing about a John Wayne movie. John Wayne by himself won the battle, did he not? I mean, he was the hero. John Wayne won, won the World War I and II and Korean War, Vietnam, whatever war he's in. John Wayne won it. Well, here's the thing. You can't win the war by yourself. You can't do it. You need other Christians. I hear people say all the time, well, you know, I love Jesus, but I don't want anything to do with this church. That's an oxymoron. <laughs> That's moronic. You can't say that. That's not true. You don't love Jesus if you don't love His church. They go together. And let me just tell you, you need other Christians. You need other Christians to uh, encourage you. You need other Christians to keep you accountable. You need other Christians there to help you hold your hands up to win the battle when you get tired. We're weak and we need each other. God has given us so many things. Listen, He's given us His Word. He's given us His Spirit. He's given us His salvation. He's given us forgiveness and grace and mercy. But listen to me. He's given us each other. And we need each other. Sometimes, guess what? You need me to come by you and just give you a little pat on the back, a hug, and, and help you lift that hand up because you get weak and tired. You know what? Sometimes I need you. Come to me, my hands get tired. I need you to come and encourage me and help me keep those hands up. Amen. We need each other. But you know what? There's even a deeper picture here of just encouragement and accountability. Aaron and her are good friends. But you know what? I believe they point us and, and paint a picture of something that's true about our salvation today. You know what that is? I think, first of all, how many of you know Aaron was the great high priest? Right? Well, you know what, 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 what is true about our salvation today, the full picture of our salvation, is that even when our faith is weak, and how many of you are glad today that God uses weak faith? Praise the living God. You know, you can have a lot of faith in the wrong thing, and that faith won't save you. People today think that, you know, if you, if you're just, if you believe something enough, that that ought to count for salvation. Listen, you can believe in the wrong. I can sit here on this pew and think that I'm on an airplane all day long. I can believe the wrong thing. Guess what? That pew is not going to take me to Hawaii. Right? I might sincerely, 100% believe that I'm on an airplane sitting in that pew on the way to Hawaii. Now, if you love me, what will you do? Say, oh, that's great, Brother Us. <laughs> you want coffee? <laughs> Have fun in Hawaii. Is that what you No, you try to help me understand that that's not really an airplane. Would you not? <laughs> it might be kind of awkward. <laughs> Our pastor thinks he's on an airplane. Oh, my gosh. You call Laura. I mean, you know. But listen, if you love somebody, you'll understand. Sometimes that, that, that we believe wrong things, do we not? Listen to me. You can have great faith in the wrong thing and it not save you. But you can have little faith. You can have weak faith in the right thing. You can have weak faith in strong Jesus. And let me tell you something. Jesus can save you. Weak faith in strong Jesus saves anybody that can believe in Him. Anybody that will turn to Him. Anybody believe in Him. And how many of you know, everybody in this room, listen to me. 
including this pastor, all of our faith is weak, is it not? You know, that's a theme in the New Testament. That's a theme in the Gospels. The, Jesus is with his disciples. They're always coming. What does Jesus tell them all the time? You have weak faith. You've got weak faith. One of the stories in Matthew, they, a demon-possessed boy comes to him, and, and, the, and, and, the, and the disciples can't do anything with him. Finally, they bring him to Jesus, and what does Jesus do? He casts out that demon. And he tells them in Matthew 17, verse 20, they say, well, Jesus, why couldn't we do that? And look at what he tells them. He said to them, Jesus said to his disciples, because of the littleness of your faith, for truly I say to you, if you have faith the size of a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move, and nothing will be impossible to you. What Jesus is saying there is, listen, the littlest faith, faith of a mustard seed, a mustard seed is the smallest seed you can imagine, a little bitty little thing, barely see it. Little bitty faith can move a mountain. Little weak faith saves. Now listen to me, when your faith is weak, I want you to know, you've got an Aaron and a Her if you've given your heart to Christ. You know who they are? Guess what? Jesus is interceding for you. Did you know that Jesus is on your side? Did you know that when you're struggling and you don't know how to pray and everything's against you and the world's not going your way and you've got enemies coming after you, I want you to know that Jesus is there to lift your hand up. And guess who else is there? The Spirit of God. Jesus and the Holy Spirit intercede for us. Let me give you the verses. These are great. Look at this. Romans chapter 8, verse 33, 34. Look at what it says about Jesus. Who, who will bring a charge against God's elect? These are people coming after you. I mean, no, people come against God's people all the time. Who will bring a charge against God's people? God is the one who justifies. Who is the one who condemns? Christ Jesus is he who died. Yes, rather, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who also intercedes for us. You know what? You may not be able to find anybody to pray for. You might have zero friends on Facebook. Nobody, or you might have a bunch of friends on Facebook, and you put on there, please pray for me, and everybody says, I'm not going to do it. I don't know. Let me just tell you something, though. Jesus will pray for you. <laughs> and if you've got Jesus praying for you, is that not enough? Jesus is interceding for you. Man, What that, that ought to get you going. Now, look at this. Not just Jesus, but the Holy Spirit. Look at this. Verse Romans 8, 26 and 27. In the same way, the Spirit also helps our weakness. How many of you know you, you can come to God with your weakness? Man, what a great truth. That ought to set you free. You don't have to come. You don't just come to God when you're strong in the Lord. You especially come to God when you're weak. And the Spirit of God helps our weakness. In the same way, the Spirit also helps our weakness, for we do not know how to pray as we should. Man, I'm so glad that's in there. How many of you are comfortable prayer warriors? You know, everybody struggles praying. Look at what he says. We don't know how to pray as we should, but the Spirit Himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And He who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is because He intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. So listen. You're, in your salvation, in your Christian life, in your day-to-day -day life, if you will honor the Lord, He'll honor you. If you will put your trust and your faith in Him, if you'll surrender to Him, He will fight your battles. But as, you, as your faith struggles, as you grow weak, you know, you, you know, all of us surrender on Sunday morning, man, I mean, we get fired up, music's good, preaching's okay, you know, we get all right, and everything, man, but we go, we go on Monday and, we're all like this. About Tuesday, though, you know, we start kind of struggling. Oh, man, I don't know, you know. By Wednesday, <laughs> listen to me. Jesus and the Holy Spirit will lift your hands back up if you'll let them. Go to Him. Trust Him. Turn to the Lord. When you honor Him, He'll help you. But He wants to help you even with your weak faith. And so God, God strengthens our weak faith. And then the last thing is this. God uses our enemies. God uses our enemies to strengthen our faith. God uses our enemies to strengthen our faith. Now, the faith, there's a little puzzle at the end of this story. I mean, you know, a lot of times the Bible puts these little, little things in there that are, you're like, what does that mean? You know, it's hard to figure out. There's a little puzzle here, and I want to explain it to you. I think there's a lot we can learn about, about what God's doing in our lives. Look at what it says at the end of this story, they beat, uh, they beat Amalek. They've won the battle. And look at what happens in verse 14. Then the Lord said to Moses, Write this in a book as a memorial and recite it to Joshua 
that I will utterly blot out the memory of Amalek from under heaven. Now again, he, this is a promise. God's saying that He's going to destroy the enemy. And I want you to know, listen, every enemy you've got, the destiny of that enemy is to be destroyed. If Whatever you're struggling with, listen to me, whatever you think is more powerful than you, God is more powerful than it. Amen? And God will destroy that enemy. And notice he says here, he says that he's, he's going to blot out the memory of Amalek under heaven. But then look at what, goes, what he goes on to say. Verse 15, Moses built an altar and named it, The Lord is my banner. This is one of the names for God, Jehovah Nissi, right? Yahweh Nissi. And what that means is, is that the Lord is my banner. The Lord is my flag. How many of you know that oftentimes in battles, what does the flag represent? It f- represents victory. Right, armies will do anything to make sure the flag is safe. You know, one of the most iconic uh, images from World War II is that picture of the of the Marines that are lifting what the flag up at Iwo Jima. Right. Well, listen, what Moses is saying here is the Lord is our banner. He's our victory. He's our flag. And then notice what happens in verse sixteen, and he said, "The Lord has sworn. The Lord will have war." against Amalek from generation to generation. Now that, read that carefully. That sounds like a bit of a contradiction, does it not? He promises in verse uh, 14 that he's going to wipe out Amalek from under heaven. Utterly wipe out Amalek from under heaven. But then in verse 16, he says the Lord will have war with Amalek from generation to generation. Which is it? Anybody see the problem but me? Which is it? Is he going to wipe him out or is there going to be war from generation to generation? Well, can I just tell you, it's going to be both. The destiny of Amalek is to be completely wiped out. But you know what? God's people still fight him. And here's what you need to know about, about, about battles in your Christian life. God allows some battles in your life. God allows them. And you know why? Because he is going to strengthen your faith. He wants to grow you. He's promised to utterly win the battle. You fight from a position of rest. You fight from a position of victory. But God allows battles in our life, listen, so that He can use them to strengthen us. God uses our battles to make us like Jesus. It's from the beginning to the end. Now watch this. He, he, he tells, explains a little bit of why in Exodus 23. You know how we read earlier that God tells them there that He's going to send His angel in front of them. And again, He says, I'm going, to, I'm going to destroy the Hivites and the Jebusites and the Canaanites and all those people. I'm going to wipe them all out. He says the same thing about them. And then look at what He says, Exodus 23, 29 and 30. He says, I'm going to wipe them all out. But now watch this. I will not drive them out before you in a single year. That's good. Now listen, this is... This is good stuff. You need, to, you need to pay attention to this. I will not drive them out before you in a single year, that the land may not become desolate and the beasts of the field become too numerous for you. In other words, you know what? You couldn't handle the land yet. You're not ready. <laughs> You're not ready for your enemies to be completely defeated. Look at verse 30. I will drive them out before you little by little until you become fruitful and take possession of the land. Now, how many of you know in the Christian life, you may have experienced this. Sometimes God will deliver you from a struggle in your life, from an enemy in your life, just like He delivered Israel from Egypt. I mean, buddy, it is instantaneous and Egypt is completely gone. Right? Some of you could t- get up here this morning and tell, give us a testimony of some sin you were in before you got saved or you used to struggle with, and in one day, at one time, you turned to the Lord, and the Lord took that completely away from you. Or God healed you physically, or God did something in your life, and I mean, it was immediate, and it was quick, and it was in a day, and you didn't struggle with it, and God took a struggle away. He overcame an enemy. I would be willing to bet that just there'd be testimony after testimony after testimony in this room of people that have experienced that very thing from the Lord. But how many of you know sometimes there's other things in your life that God allows? You know He can do it. You know He can defeat the enemy. He's promised to defeat the enemy. But listen to me. He lets those things, He doesn't defeat them all at once. It's little by little. He lets you struggle with it over a period of time. 
I, maybe I'm the only one. That's my experience, right? Well, listen, what is God doing? He's growing you. He's making you like Jesus. He's forming you into something that's beyond all that you could ask or think. And He's got a bigger goal in your life than even defeating your enemies. It's to make you like Him. That's what He's doing. Do you trust Him? Can you walk with Him? Listen, let those big battles, let those little battles, let all those battles, don't let them drive you away from Jesus. Let them drive you to Jesus. Amen? Set on the rock. Seek the Lord. Trust the Lord to, to lift your hands. And keep your hands lifted and surrender to Him. And you wait. You watch. God will win the battle. Amen? Your enemies will be defeated. It's a picture of salvation. Well, if you're here this morning and you've never given your heart to Christ, listen to me. You need to surrender. That's what salvation is. You need to surrender to Christ. You need to say to God, God, I give up. <laughs> I'm tired of living my life my own way. I'm tired of living my life under my power. I need you. I need you to come in my life. I need you to fight my battles. Jesus, will you come and be my warrior king? I give my life to you. If that's your heart cry today, listen, in just a moment, we're going to stand. I'm going to pray for us. Brother Ken's going to come. We're going to worship the Lord. You come. Give your heart to Christ today. Today can be the day of your salvation. You can, you, can, you can leave here knowing that you belong to Him and He is fighting for you. You may be here this morning and say, Brother Russ, I know I'm saved. I'm, I'm, I know I, I've given my heart to Christ, but I, there's battles in my life that I need the Lord to fight for me. I, I, want to, I want to surrender again. How many of you know Moses had to keep putting his hands up, right? That's a great picture. Most of us are like this most of the time. You need to, you need to get those hands up. You need to get those hands up. Listen to me. This altar is open. You come pray. Seek the Lord. You, you surrender those things to Him, even today. You may be here this morning and say, Brother Russ, I want, to, I want to join a church. I want to be a part of a group that's going to help me walk with the Lord. I can't do it by myself. I want to be a part of a, of a, of a, of a believing fellowship of Christians. You know what fellowship is? It's just two fellows in the same ship. <laughs> that's all it is. We're all in the same boat. And we're all trying to help each other along. Amen. If you need to get in the boat and be with us, we'd love to have you here at Enon. Whatever your decision is, let's all stand together. Let me pray for us. Brother Ken, to come and lead us in our time of worship. All right, Lord, we love you today. God, we thank you for loving us. Lord, we thank you so much that you are a great warrior. You are in our midst. Lord, you quiet us with your love. God, I thank you to, this morning that the, that the most awesome, fiercest warrior in the universe loves us with an everlasting love. God, I thank you today that you fight our battles when we look to you, when we surrender to you. Lord, I just pray that if there's anybody here this morning that needs to be saved, God, they need to give their heart to you. Lord, I pray in Jesus' name, right now, you convict them. Lord, you help them see their need for Jesus. You give, her, give them faith to believe in him. And Lord, you give them the courage to respond and follow him publicly. Lord, I just pray for every believer in this room this morning, Lord, who's facing a battle. A battle that's overwhelming to them. Lord, right now it may feel like they're being beat. They're being defeated. God, I pray in Jesus' name that you help them. Encourage them right now by your Spirit in a way that only you can. Speak to their hearts, Lord. Give them your peace that passes understanding. Let the joy of the Lord be their strength. Lord, help them to lift their hands to you and trust you to sit on the rock of Jesus. And Lord, to, to know that the Spirit of God and Jesus himself is on both sides holding their hands up so they can win the battle, Lord. Just pray that you have your hand on this invitation, that your will would be done. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.